Look at all that money, you have the money that they spend. Take another look now and take some time for him. I know cut trees for paper, cause it hurts the environment. Stop deforestation, yeah, it's time for him. Oh, an acre of hemp makes 20 barrels of oil. To poison all our soil People got no food They got no clothes They got no rent Well, right now It's time for hemp Thank you for taking time for hemp I'm your host, Casper Leach You are listening to the broadcast of Time for Hemp All around the world On Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube But of course iHeartRadio. We are the only 24-hour-a-day, seven-day broadcasting into iHeartRadio that is focused on cannabis only with a team of people that are dedicated to ending prohibition at all corners of the earth. With that said, it is Leap Wednesday, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. I would encourage you to go to leap.cc. Find yourself a speaker to bring into your neck of the woods to help educate the minds about the need to end prohibition. Big shout out to KDK Distributors. Want to say thank you to the whole team up there for giving us a grant to keep us loud, proud, and strong. Send our love to all of the listeners up in Canada. 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 Okay, up in Canada. And I want to remind people that we have a listening audience all around the world. Thank you for those who are listening in Japan. I appreciate your emails. Also, anytime you hear the word joint on the big broadcast, don't forget, nearly two point. Five million people all around the world pack their pipes, their bongs, their vaporizers, or twist up a joint and take time for him. Now that I've done this long, happy introduction into the broadcast, I'm going to hush my mouth and enjoy my joint while my joint host has a joint chat with our joint guest here in the big joint broadcast at time for him. Your Honor? Well, once again, we are going to have a smoking show today with David Clark, Leap Speaker, as our guest. And before we bring David on live, I just have two quick thoughts. One is when we're talking about Canada, about Canada, our neighbor to the north. Right. I just read a number. In the year 2012, 57,000. 429, just shy of 60,000 Canadians were arrested for simple possession of pot. Good Lord. In one year. Wow. I, well, what can you say? I mean, some things just are self-contained. You can't even comment on them. It's just not necessary. And, and the other observation, and let me make it clear, this is humor. This is not literal. But with a 24-7 show, I think we might think about meth only. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I I am not advocating it. I do believe it is a dangerous drug, which therefore needs to be legalized and regulated. Well, one thing that's helped me stay awake 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is aging every time I get ready to go into a deep state of dreamland. I got to get up and go take a leak, so I never get a good night's sleep. (laughs) Well, with that said, we do want to get on to our joint chat. (laughs) David Clark. Welcome. Welcome aboard, David. David, you are currently a leap speaker. Would you please give us a a sense of what your law enforcement background is that led you to LEAP or that resulted in your being able to be a LEAP speaker? Sure, no problem. Um, first of all, I'm really, really happy to be with you today. Um, I look forward to this and I uh, always enjoy your show. Um, my law enforcement career uh, started shortly after I got out of the military. I spent 10 years in the U.S. Army as an infantry paratrooper. Uh, I got out in 2000 and moved actually to Round Rock, Texas, uh, and uh, started working security at the Lower Colorado River Authority. Um, Stayed in Texas for a little bit and eventually moved to South Carolina. 
where I attended the Criminal Justice Academy in 2002 and worked as a police officer at the College of Charleston, uh, where actually I got to see firsthand how the laws concerning drugs do not apply equally amongst all segments of society. Uh, I got a, a good firsthand uh, view of that at the college. And then I went uh, from the college to work at the North Charleston, South Carolina Police Department and worked there until 2010. During my time working there, I worked as a patrol officer, a field training officer, training new officers uh, before they could patrol the streets on their own, and also worked in undercover narcotics and vice. In working in undercover, and this is an observation I've made before, is it fair to say the job required, mandated, you to be dishonest? Yes, absolutely. What kind of things did it force you to do that you would look at now and say, that really wasn't an honest thing? And I don't mean that in an insulting or demeaning way, as you know. Uh, no, I, I, I actually agree completely. Uh, one of the things that it, it really, that you had to do to do your job well and be convincing was to befriend people that, uh, you know, ultimately, your goal was to, to put them in jail, um, which is a very interesting, uh, in a psychological standpoint, <laughs> you know, from, from that standpoint. Um, and Ironic. In, and I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. You... I guess say working in, in undercover narcotics, I said, and vice as well, uh, because there's so much carryover between the two. Um, many of the things that have been brought about because of the war on drugs, where you're dealing with, uh, you know, asset forfeiture and seizure really, really kicked in due to the war on drugs and, and really have been pushed, now carry over into vice investigations as well. And, and, and I consider them all to be related uh, because, you know, you're dealing with, with prohibiting things that, um, that people want and are going to get. Um, and uh, it's just the things that you have to do, the, the lies that you have to tell, you, you, the, the people that you have to make trust you over time uh, and to then turn on them um, and see the damage that you've done, uh, you know, for me, it had a big effect. Is it fair to say that, all right, first, you had to misrepresent who you were, correct? Yes. And yes, completely. Are, are you old enough? to have heard the old street myth that if one asked a person, are you a police officer, that the person was required by law to answer honestly, yes, yes, I'm a cop. Are you old enough to have heard that street myth? Oh, absolutely, and that's exactly what it is. It's a complete myth. <laughs> Not and true at all. And in fact, you're, you're required and legally permitted to misrepresent who you are in the undercover situation. Yes, absolutely. Let's jump to Texas for a moment. Okay. We, in, with the war on drugs, and by the way, are we fighting a war on drugs? You've been in Afghanistan. You've seen war. Uh, uh, yes. I, actually, I spent uh, from 2010 to 2014 in Afghanistan working as a private military contractor. Uh, working as a police advisor, um, and I got to see the war on drugs, if you, you want to call it that, in action in Afghanistan, because, you know, they have programs over there. And what they want to do is they want to destroy the poppy fields. Um, and the way that they go about that is they've been working through the police and the Afghan army to do it, but they will take the police chiefs of a particular province and the, the, the U.S. government will give them money based on how many acres of poppy fields they destroy during the growing season. Uh, as with everything related to the war on drugs, this is ripe for corruption. And what happens is the police chiefs who know who the farmers are that grow the poppy because it's all the same community 
uh, will go to them and say, hey, look, we have to come up with numbers. We have to destroy certain amounts of poppy. What will happen is that there will be fields that will be grown specifically for the purposes of being destroyed. They already know that it's going to happen. But everyone wants a piece of the pie. The, the police chiefs want the money. Uh, the farmers want the money. That's going to trickle down from the police chiefs if they let him get his numbers. And the military is back there keeping track of all the numbers and saying we've accomplished our mission. That is about the sickest, funniest thing I've heard all morning. That's truly yeah. ill. Yeah, growing, absolutely. growing poppies so that you have poppies to destroy so that you can have numbers and still be in the business. Yes. Absolutely. Did you did you see any connection between organizations like the Taliban, ISIS, um, the terrorist groups, and opium production, growing poppies? I I personally did not see that connection. Um, what I did see were farmers that most likely never went more than 50 miles, uh, traveled greater than 50 miles from the place they were born, living with no power, no running water, uh, in Stone Age conditions that were doing what they could to feed their family and, and make a living. And growing poppy is one way to do that. Um, and, of course, you and I both know that one of the reasons they can make a living doing that is because we have a black market that drives the, uh, the prices up uh, and, and creates this demand. Is there any reason why, let's say, for example, LEAP succeeds and these drugs, whether they're dangerous ones or arguably not dangerous ones or even helpful ones, if, if they are legalized and regulated in this country, do you know of any reason why we can't grow our own poppies? No, I, I don't. I mean, we have, we can grow most everything else that, that we want to grow here. We have plenty of fertile lands. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be able to grow poppies. Well, as as I'm, you know, as I'm proud of saying and have said many times, probably enough to make Casper crazy, and if not, I'll get there. We're Americans. We can do what we set our minds to do. You want to go to the moon? No problem. It's just a matter of how many months. We can grow poppies, and in fact, I don't know if our listeners are aware, I'm guessing you are aware, that it is legal to grow poppies, used to produce opium in Colorado, certainly, and nationally. And it doesn't become illegal, Colorado and nationally, unless you cut them down, slit the, the top so the opium drips out, have what they call the straws inside your house. Then you've crossed the line, and it's illegal. But growing the plant itself, in fact, the opium poppy, is common in the United States. They've changed the name, I've noted now, at least twice. So it's just not as easy to tell when you go into the uh, hardware store seed shelves to tell which are the opium poppies. But they're right, right there, buck twenty nine a pack. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting because in one form, it's perfectly fine. Uh, do one or two things uh, different or, or modified in some way, or you know, we've got the poppy growing here, but as long as I don't cut a slit in the side, I'm okay. I do that, and now I go to jail. It's ridiculous. Doesn't seem to make much sense to me, and they're awfully pretty flowers. I really like them as flowers. <laughs> <laughs> when you were in Texas, were you... We, we all hear stories about Texas and South Texas and the border issues. Is that something you were exposed to during your time uh, no. in Texas? No, it wasn't. When I worked for the Lower Colorado River Authority, I was based strictly around Austin and spent much of my time around the uh, Mansfield Dam area, uh, patrolling in that area and things like that. So I never really was exposed to issues with the border or, or things of that nature. Um, and, and the... Uh, in their defense, uh, not that they're on trial, but the, the Lower Colorado River Authority kind of has a different sort of uh, job than your standard law enforcement because they're 
they're uh, worried about the lands that border the Little Colorado River and making sure that it's used properly in terms of recreation and the land isn't destroyed and things of that nature. So it's not really the same type of law enforcement um, as your, your standard uh, police department or sheriff's department or things of that nature. I have a friend in Colorado who began as a water lawyer in Colorado, and one day he said to me, all right, Lenny, here's everything you need to know about water law. Water flows uphill to money. <laughs> that sounds about right. I thought that was pretty good myself. And, and let me ask you this off-topic question. Is Austin as cool a place as we hear up here? It It is cool, but uh, I think that I'm... I'm probably uh, a bad person to ask, and that I, I, maybe I'm kind of a little bit of a stick in the mud. I, I I like just spending you know nights at home with my wife, so I don't I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe I'm the wrong person uh, to appreciate Austin and all its glory, but I certainly had a good time there. Um, it's definitely a good place to visit. So the famous music scene was not your particular attraction. To Austin. Uh, well, to, to some extent, I love good live music, uh, and I'm fortunate that where I live now in, in Houston, uh, we have a good music scene. So, uh, but yeah, that that was one of the things that actually stood out uh, about Austin to me was the music scene. So, definitely worth a visit. You mentioned okay. I'm making note of that. That reinforces what my thinking has been. You mentioned that you had worked as an officer and undercover in North Charleston, South Carolina. Correct. And you also mentioned, and I'm changing your words, so correct me if I'm changing them incorrectly. Uh, okay. But you referred to what I heard as racial disparity and gave me a, a reminder. Would you tell us about North Charleston, South Carolina being in the news recently in this area? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's on the news uh, nationally these, this last week based on the uh, shooting uh, of an unarmed black man who was fleeing uh, from a traffic stop and was shot in the back. And the officer, uh, after release of a videotape uh, or of, of a video that was filmed by a bystander, the officer was charged with murder. Uh, and this officer was working at North Charleston Police Department at the same time I was. However, he and I never worked together, and I can't really claim to know him. I know the sense of it. When I read an article about a drug bust, every single one I read, what's going through the back of my mind is, when I get to the list of names, I really don't want to see one of my clients there. And I'm just thinking the impact it would have on a society as a whole and on a local society to read that some guy in what I'm supposing was a minor traffic event who decides to run away gets shot in the back. Did they think he was a fleeing armed bank robber? Did they think he was a fleeing kidnapper? Uh, well, in this particular case, the gentleman had a, an arrest warrant out for child support. Oh, well, there, uh, and, there you go. And, and that was it. And the, uh, now, of course, the the officer's version of events says that they got into a scuffle. Uh, the officer u deployed his taser. The suspect took the taser and was preparing to use it against the officer. The officer feared for his safety and, and shot him. The video seems to, to contradict uh, some of that. Um, you know, I, clearly I wasn't there. I didn't see the first half of the incident, and I always, you know, I hate to make snap judgments, but I will say this. Based on what I saw of the video, uh, I I have to I shake my head in, in disbelief at what I see. But to me, my personal opinion is that it appeared to be a, a, a really bad shoot, a very bad choice on the part of the officer. And I have talked to some other officers, that current officers, that also feel that way. Um you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming as time goes on, more facts will come out. But it is certainly a sad situation for everyone involved. Well, we got to take a commercial break. But, yeah, I've seen the video, and the officer stands straight, strut, 
aims directly and shoots the person in the back, apparently aiming for the heart and lungs. You know, could have gone for the calves, could have aimed for the knees, could have aimed for any other part of the body, could have just not even pulled the trigger. Then after the uh, body's laying there on the ground, the video shows the officer walking up around the body, dropping something on the ground, what appears to have been a taser. Then the officer comes back and picks it back up apparently having second thoughts about planting evidence. So Casper, let me let me respond very briefly to that and then I'll shut up so you can do your job. Right. Uh, when we are taught how to deal with incidents where shots are going to be fired, we are trained to never fire a warning shot, to never shoot to wound, you only shoot to stop. And that's done by shooting at the center of mass. So it's shoot or don't shoot. There is nothing in between in, in training. And, and David, is that consistent with your training? Yeah, absolutely. We are not trained at all to fire at an extremity or anything of that nature because in a deadly force situation, in a true deadly force situation, it's very easy for you to miss if you're aiming at a small target. So you aim center mass. Well, Casper. <laughs> with that said, we're going to take a commercial break and come back where we left off here at Time for Hemp. You are listening to the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network. Please share us with your friends. THCF Medical Clinics are the premier physician's clinic in the United States. THCF has offices all across the United States from Hawaii to Michigan. THCF Medical Clinics has helped approximately 150,000 patients obtain their medical marijuana permits to legally possess, grow, and use medical marijuana. If you have chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, or any other neurological degenerative disease, or if you have any gastrointestinal disorders such as GERD, irritable bowel syndrome, or if you have AIDS, cancer, spastic disorder, seizure disorders, or glaucoma, call us at 1-800-723-0188 or visit us online at hemp.org. Again, the number is 1-800-723-0188 and the site is hemp.org. <laughs> Get up, get up. 
Right there with you, come up. Uh. And in my garden, I will grow my own. You gonna grow it? Hey, marijuana. Sing it, sing it. Come on. Oh, marijuana. Hey, uh, speaking of which. Oh, marijuana. Can you pass that over here, please? Oh, Let me hit it one time. Yeah, it's one of my favorite songs. When I hear that, I'm dancing around and kicking up my heels. And, of course, I'm hitting my pipe. And I'm rolling up a joint here on the big broadcast. It is Wednesday. Time for Hemp is celebrating all the amazing people at LEAP.CC. Leap, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And uh, if it wasn't for prohibition, we wouldn't have an artificial, I'm from Indiana, so we say that wrong, artificial price on our herbs. What I'm talking about, like I said, I'm from Indiana. Do you know that a uh, ounce of uh, just average marijuana in Indiana is going for $460 an ounce? Where here in Oregon, I'm a medical marijuana card holder, and I get my Primo Bud for free. Just saying. <laughs> well, as I said, I'm going to enjoy listening to this joint conversation with my joint host as they engage in a joint chat and I engage on my joint. But before I do, I have a question for David. David, I don't know if I'm safe anymore. Good God, I hear that Washington, D.C. alone has an average of 400 shootings a year of local uh, citizens being hit by the police, 400 shootings uh, a year that are uh, fired off by police officers hitting civilians, many of them unnecessary. That's just one town. Uh, I read on the press that I've got a better chance of being gunned down or hit by a bullet and killed by a member of the police department in the United States than being killed by a terrorist. I see them uh, tackling people. Uh, across the United States for minor crimes, shooting uh, pepper spray in people's eyes. What in the world is going on with those who are supposed to protect us and serve us? Well, my take on that is that this is an inevitable result of the over of the criminalization of minor. Uh, offenses that are not causing harm to anyone else. Um, when you start to criminalize everything, then that, by its very nature, creates uh, interactions between police officers and citizens. 
by nature of having more interactions uh, over supposedly criminal occurrences, you can see where uh, this is, this would lead, and I believe it's it's led to where we are today. David, in your work, were you involved with or were you aware of any SWAT drug raids on houses on civilians? Yes. Um, and actually, when I worked in undercover narcotics, we uh, we served our own search warrants and arrest warrants. So we did our own raids, um, sometimes with SWAT support. Um, I believe now that that police department, I've been away from there for a little bit, but I believe now that department has uh, now made it where any uh, raid uh, is performed by SWAT now instead of uh, the units performing their own raids. But when I was there, we did our own. Aside from being overly dramatic, which, which I am, is it fair to characterize a SWAT raid on a house as an armed home invasion? Oh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. During... The, the whole purpose is, is shock and awe and control. During the time that you were working undercover, during the time that you were working as a Leo, as a law enforcement officer, how many armed home invasions not carried out by police agencies did you see? Oh, gosh, I don't know the exact number of, uh, you're talking about uh, of I, home invasions by police that were not what I'm, armed? What no, I'm really, <laughs> what I'm really, <laughs> they're all armed. <laughs> I like I like your answer, and let me ask my question better. But that that's an interesting answer. There is no unarmed police invasion of a home. What about criminal invasions, armed invasions of homes, not by police, but the kind of stuff we'd see in the, in the movies that I tend to uh, watch that may not be great movies? Armed home invasions by criminals who are not law enforcement officers. That yeah, happened. Well, uh, it, it certainly did occur. I would not uh, say much. I would say m the police were involved in, in, those, in the home invasions much more than the criminals were. Um, and I would also say that nine times out of ten when there were criminal home invasions, they were related to uh, the drug war, related to the, the prohibition of drugs. Why? W what does that mean? What do you mean by that? Well... Uh, many times when we would investigate these home invasions, what you find is a link to drug activity. Drugs were being sold out of that home. Drugs were being processed out of that home. There was uh, a beef between uh, maybe the home that was invaded was the home of a drug dealer, but another local drug dealer uh, had a beef with that drug dealer. So they, they then uh, deal with that uh, the way that the street deals with that, which would be home invasions. They're either wanting to harm the person or wanting to uh, steal their drugs or their money or their guns and things of that nature. But that's directly related to prohibition. We have much of the violence we have associated with drugs is due to the fact that they are prohibited. Um, and, and so, you know, if we had legalization, that, that violence would drop off dramatically, I believe. So the attempt of prohibition, of the policy of prohibition, if I'm hearing you correctly, results in what we would call real crime that would not have occurred but for the illegality of the drugs. Yes, I'd say that would be a fair assessment. So the government, in fact, is creating crime affecting civilians, not victimless crime, but crimes with real victims in its attempt to prohibit substance. Yes, yes. By, by virtue of creating a crime out of a victimless crime, possessing a, a drug, uh, then on the periphery you get many real crimes perpetrated against people. Let, your background is so extensive, it's hard to know where to go next, and I tend to jump around anyway without the assistance of, of meth or other forms of speed. College was a hell of a long time ago. It wasn't even this century. Let me ask this. Were there any commercial chemical businesses in your jurisdiction? 
in any of the locations where you worked. Com when you say, could you explain when you say commercial? Chemical? Yes. Here, here's here's what I'm trying to set up. Let me jump ahead. What I'm trying to set up is to manipulate you into saying, if you believe it, that when people are cooking meth at home, th those were the hazmat incidents. It wasn't responding to a hazmat incident at Merck or Pfizer or a for real chemistry laboratory producing for real legal drugs. Yes, um, and, and funny, you did uh, go into hazmat because I was on the Charleston County uh, COBRA, as it was called COBRA for Chemical, Ordnance, Biological, and Radiological, uh, Charleston County COBRA hazmat response team. So when we came across meth labs, uh, if I was not one of the officers actually busting the meth lab, I would be one of the ones that was called out to put on the big yellow plastic suit in 95-degree weather in Charleston, South Carolina in the summer and go in and dismantle the meth lab. In the hazmat responses, and I don't know if there's an answer for this, but let's give it a go. Were the meth lab, home meth lab, hazmat situations a tiny piece of what the hazmat teams were involved in or a significant piece? Uh, I would say a significant piece. The, the, the hazmat team trained for a number of different incidences. Like, you know, we had uh, several uh, railroad tracks that ran through the area that carried hazardous materials. So we would train for, a tra uh, train for you know, if, if there was a train derailment that spilled uh, a dangerous chemical. Uh, we had uh, plants that were there. Uh, we had uh, pulp and paper plants and things of that nature. So we trained on all of it. In terms of actual deployment, uh, far more likely to be actually used and deployed uh, in dealing with things like meth labs. So the training was there. And let me shift again within the same subject. When you were an officer, did you go out on the street thinking, well, there's some laws that I think are really good laws, so I'll enforce those, and I don't like these other laws that much, so I'll, I'll not enforce those. Was that an option open to you as an ethical person? Um, you see, and this, what, you're, what you're getting at is, is now is getting into why I voluntarily chose to leave the law enforcement profession. Why did um, you voluntarily choose to leave? In good conscience, I could not continue to enforce laws that I disagree with. That, that's the bottom line. Um, I did not feel it was right to put people in jail for things that were not harming another, uh, and, I, and I could not continue to do it. Is part of the reason you went into law enforcement to do right to make things better? Uh, yes. Um, and, 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 I, and I think that most of, of the, I think by far, the, the majority of the officers that I worked with felt that way as well. And, and it, it's such a, you get sucked in to believe that you're doing the right thing. Uh, you know, we're, we're all raised on, you know, at least my generation, you know, Nancy Reagan and the Just Say No you know, drugs are bad. Drugs are bad, and they're dangerous, and we have to take whatever steps we, we can to combat them. So when you are a new police officer, you're inundated with that. Uh, on top of it, you, they, they try to desensitize you. And here's, I'll give you an example. As a field training officer, which I was, you have to train officers in all aspects of their job, which will include traffic stops, searching people, uh, you know, doing all the different things that, that a patrol officer on the street is supposed to do. Well, I found over time that, you know, people are a little, are naturally disinclined to write tickets, uh, to punish people for behavior that's not harming someone else. Uh, so you would have new officers that, They'd see a violation and they'd pull people over, but you know they no, they don't really want to give the person a ticket. It was just a turn signal out, or you know they didn't use their turn signal or their brake light was out. But 
it's something that you need to do. And, and by that, I mean, even if the department does not have a specific quota, you must write 10 tickets a day, what you will find is them pulling you into the office and saying your productivity is down. So you are pressured to put things on paper, meaning write tickets. You are pressured to... Uh, where where I was at, it was very zero tolerance for drugs. Drugs, drugs, drugs. So a patrol officer who should be out interacting with the good people of the community, finding out what their needs are, what what their concerns and what their fears are, and helping them with those, was instead driving around looking for the guy on the street corner that he could get out, uh, uh, search, and find a dime bag of weed so he could take him to jail. Well, one thing I understand is that that's how they pay their bills. You got to be able to have uh, revenue coming in, and that don't happen unless you put out tickets, or in my case, sell advertising spots on your broadcasting network here at Time for Hemp. are listening to the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network. Please share us with your friends. Serious Seeds is your source for quality cannabis and sativa seeds. Serious Seeds are the creators of legendary strains like AK-47, Bubblegum, Chronic, Cali Mist, and White Russian. The AK-47 is probably the most awarded strain on the planet. The high THC content of AK-47 makes it the perfect medical strain for patients seeking quick pain relief. Cali Mist is an almost pure sativa. Female medical cannabis patients have reported that this strain helps relieve menstrual cramps. Sirius Seeds just acquired another Dutch high-quality seed bank, Magus Genetics. From now on, Sirius Seeds can offer you even more award-winning strains. The fine folks at Sirius Seeds strive to breed the best cannabis genetics that they can find, so patients can rely on the effectiveness of their medicine. Go to SiriusSeeds.com to grow your medicine. That site again is SiriusSeeds.com. Well, I went and had a bowl, good green reefer, big fat don't be much, much sweeter. Mighty don't hide it. Yeah, baby, fire up right now. Be loud, be proud. Come out of the closet. Let everybody know that you utilize marijuana. I don't care if it's for recreation or medical or what little groovy term you want to call it. You're using it. You got to have enough guts to come out and say, hey, this is what I do. And, you know, uh, things will get a little easier all around the world. If I seem a little energized today, it's because before the program, I spent an hour working out inside a gym. Then Jim got dressed and went to work. <laughs> I got my coffee, got busy <laughs> trying to end prohibition. Now, pass this on to you, Your Honor. <laughs> Let's talk about prohibition for a minute. We've had drug prohibition since 1937 and perhaps back to 1918 in the United States. It, prohibition isn't working. No great secret, right? Uh, well, no, I think it's been one of the most successful race-based programs that we've ever created. And in what way has it been <laughs> successful as a, as a race-based program? What has it accomplished? Well, it was originally, if you go back and, and look at the origins, uh, especially way back with, with Harry Onslinger, um, you know, this all started due to, to race. Um, he wanted to control uh, the, uh, the minorities that were in the United States, from the African Americans to the Chinese. Um, so if you look at its actual origins, I think it's been very successful at uh, keeping tabs on, keeping control of, and, uh, um, you know, really uh, keeping the state involved intimately in, in the, the lives of minorities in America. 
Well, in fact, I, I can say personally, every time I smoke some really good pot, the first thing I want to do is be a black man out raping white women. I, it just absolutely you do. That, that's have, that's what it that's what it causes. Um, well, and and, 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 you know, and, and I sometimes step on the shadows of white men. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> I wouldn't admit that publicly, but as long as it's just. Us guys chatting here, that's fine. Because that was one of the and, reasons why it was outlawed in the 30s, because it made black men want to step on the shadows of white men. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, there was truth to it to the extent that there were, in fact, some black musicians, blues, jazz, who smoked marijuana. And, and we also know that Anslinger had a lot to say about using the word marijuana with the idea being because it was a Hispanic-sounding word, it would be more unsettling, scarier to the white majority at the time. And, and we still have great debates over what the proper terminology is. Yeah, I know. I've got a lot of friends who are afraid of the word taco. <laughs> I, I, one of my clo my closest friend moved to Colorado in 1973 or so. One of his first jobs was working for Taco Ding Dong, and I remember getting a multi-page handwritten letter from him going on and on about how excellent the quality was of the ingredients. Now, if I go down the corner and I buy my heroin or my methamphetamine from the guy down the corner. David, did you ever run into a drug dealer who, before selling meth, heroin, things that we would generally say are pretty dangerous or very dangerous drugs, did you ever run into a dealer when you're working undercover who said, well, David, whatever your name is, I, I believe you're not a cop, could you please show me your ID so I know you're over 21 before you buy this drug from me, this pot, this joint? No, that was never a question that I was asked. Not even once. Not not even once. Well, and I know there's a couple times when I got a bag of herb and I smoked it and went, oh, my, what's, <laughs> what did you guys put on this? And I looked on the side of the bag and there was never, like, any list of ingredients that they doctored it with. I cool. used to. I used to tell a joke. I, I would have a baggie of something in it and someone would ask, Boy, where, where did that come from? And my answer always was, I don't know. When I got it, the label had washed off. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and, and partially it was the humor of, we don't know what's in it. It's like somebody that buys ecstasy on the street today. And they'll say, in my criminal defense practice, they'll sit down there and say, well, it was ecstasy. And I look at them and say, how do you know what it was? It was well, white powder in a baggie, right? Yeah. And did you run it through a lab? No. They, people don't know what they're taking. Well, we give that, the death penalty randomly for heroin use if it happens to be too strong a batch. And that's one of the reasons why I don't take edibles at uh, these marijuana fairs. Because, I mean, you don't know how much marijuana it was, how the marijuana was put in there. You don't know the condition of the kitchen, where it was actually cooked, how many hands touched it. If it was cooked at a high enough degree of a temperature and blah, all the things that go with that, they go into standardized testing for public consumption. And so that's the other aspect of this as well. I mean, the, on a variety of levels, having this uh, prohibition is, is, is a hindrance on, on so many fronts. And we're seeing the opposite of that in Colorado as we learn in the free state of Colorado. We have more control more consistency, more checking for pollutants, mold, pesticides, um, accurate labeling on edibles, so people do know what they're getting instead of the label washed off when I got it. All right, so, well, we, we're getting down to, we got about seven minutes maybe, if that, six. So, David, I got another question for you. If uh, uh, you as an officer, and how do the officers react now when they're told, hey, we're going to take... Uh, a, a checkpoint, a DUI checkpoint weekend, and not only are we going to test the breath, we're going to do mandatory blood sampling from all of our drivers, and if any of the drivers refuse, arrest them. And uh, uh, then the next night, we've got this new equipment that makes it possible for us to drive up and down streets and scan into homes, 
and see uh, exactly how much money is on hand and if we have any idea of any type of meth labs that are being built that will give us an opportunity to narrow things down. So everybody get your uniforms on and your badges ready and let's go. David G. We had, were believe, you asking what? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. How, how do you react were to you that? Asking, and, and how do how the, officers would react to that? Yeah, how, how are they reacting to that? I mean, this is uh, you see it. You see it happening in, in today's America, right? And and I think obviously these things happen, which means that the officers are participating. Um, you know, they have to participate for it to happen. But I am talking more and more these days with officers who are very uncomfortable with these sorts of activities and of course i i share with them about leap uh and that's my biggest hope is that officers will start being vocal about their disagreement with these things and that they feel they are not right that they're a threat to to individual liberty and a threat to freedom and that they they cause more damage uh than they protect people from and, uh, and, and, I, and I think it's coming. It's happening over time. But of course, doing the right thing never, can never happen fast enough. David, you refer to the militarization of police departments. What do you mean by that, and why is that a problem? Well, I, I, what I mean by that is officers are being uh, you know, outfitted more and more with things that you would see in Afghanistan uh, on a regular basis as opposed to, uh, what you would think you should see on the streets of America. Um, you've got the armored vehicles, you have tanks, uh, you know, the track vehicles, you have the body armor, you have all these things. And on top of it, uh, SWAT is being used more and more for things that were normally the functions of regular police officers going to a house, knocking on the door, talking to occupants, well, those days are getting pushed out in lieu of SWAT raid, SWAT raid, SWAT raid. Um, so you are getting an overall militarization uh, that creates, in officers' minds, a we, you know, us versus them uh, mindset. It's no longer citizens aren't any longer people that are that are in my community that I work with and that I serve and that I'm here to help, they are, there's, there's the city before me, and people are dirty, and I'm going to go out and find them. i got to find what's dirty, and everyone is possibly dirty, and I'm going to do what I can, even if that's using pretext, you know, pretextual stops, whatever, to find out what it is they're dirty about. When you were on the street, did you ever do any knocking talks? Absolutely. You'd go up to a door, single officer, maybe two, knock and talk, right? Yes. In the knock and talks that you did, how often did you find yourself in a situation where you were standing there thinking, oh, man, I should have called in SWAT. I should be here with guys with body armor and machine guns behind me, and here I'm just knocking on the door. Boy, did I screw up. That happened much? No, very, very rarely did that happen. And, in fact, you were armed anyway for that situation. Yes. And trained. Yes. You ever run into a house full of machine guns pointed at you, like in the movies that I admit I watch? Uh, no, no, I never had that uh, situation. I've certainly encountered people with guns, uh, but never to the extent that you're going to see in the movies. <laughs> if... If prohibition were only given a little more time, and Casper hears me ask this frequently, if prohibition were given, in the words of Richard Nixon, four more years, would it work? Well, based on past performance, I would say no, and I don't see how any thinking person could reasonably believe that it's going to work. Um, we have steadily increased... Uh, the measures that police can use to fight the you know, this, this evil, you know, scourge of society, drugs. Uh, we have taken liberties. We have increased police power. Um, and nothing that they do uh, helps. In fact, it's uh, the, something that uh, a street corner in a minority neighborhood has in common with a supermax prison is that you can get illegal drugs at either one. 
All so right. if we can't keep illegal drugs out of our most secure facilities and secure prisons in the United States, what on earth makes you think we can do anything about them being on the street as long as we have a black market? Now, we're down to about two minutes here, and I'm going to remind uh, your honor that this is public radio, and FCC dictates on what we're allowed to say. We, you know, So we cannot say on the air, what if Richard Nixon had four more years? That that I, fr- that phrase has been banned. We cannot say what if Richard Nixon had four more years. That, <laughs> you can call the DEA ass clowns. You can tell me to, to to fuck off, but you cannot say what if Richard Nixon had four more years. That causes nightmares and tremors in too many people. You'll have to send me an email and tell me if you're serious. <laughs> <laughs> Because with Nixon, I, I you know, I would believe anything. <laughs> well, no, but we are down to the last couple of minutes of the show, so this does give you a chance to give a shout out to your favorite website and URLs and upcoming events, if you like. We'll start with our joint guest here, David Clark. Uh, I would, I would like to say, in closing, very quickly, if there are any police officers listening that uh, are interested in this topic, uh, investigate LEAP, see what they're about, follow your conscience, and do the right thing. Well, I can certainly tell you that having Dave Clark on the show today has made me feel glad all over. All right. Your Honor, last message. I want to remind people to go to LEAP.cc. If you are not a former or current law enforcement officer, a former prosecutor, you can still join Leap.cc as a supporter. And the supporters are critical to our survival financially, to our meaningfulness in society, and they number well over hundreds of thousands of people, although our speakers are in the range of about 300. So I'm going to shout out to Leap.cc, and let me spell it again, L-E-A-P dot C-C, Law yeah. Enforcement Against Prohibition, and I, want C-C. To, and I want to remind people, we are 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a group of growing activists who are dedicated to ending prohibition, and like a good joint, we are best when shared with friends. With that said, remember the next time you hear me, you'll know that it's time for hemp. Look at all that money, yeah, the money that they spent. Take another look and spend some time for him. Don't cut trees for paper, cause it hurts the environment. Stop deforestation, yes, it's time for him. Whoa, an acre of hemp makes 20 bales of oil. Poison.